Hey everybody, the moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. The Cherry 3D printer is now complete. Not only is it complete, but it actually prints. The quality of the prints that I've gotten out of it so far have been significantly better than I thought they were going to be, and they've highlighted some stuff that I'm going to be able to change in the upcoming weeks that'll mean that we can get even better quality prints out of them. Now, if you're just joining me and this is your first episode, you probably want to go back and watch episodes 1, 2, and 3 to find out how we got to where we are now. But, without further ado, let's jump into the rest of the tutorial and get it done. Now, if you buy motors that have the connectors on them, this won't really be an issue, but you may still have to test for this type of thing. The motors I bought had four wires and no connectors on them, so we have to figure out which coils are which, and then we have to pair those coils up when we do the soldering. So we would use something like your multimeter here, switch it to the continuity test, and as you can see, continuity test means it'll actually read zero zero across the board when it's got a connection. So what we're looking for is which wires we have to cross in order to get a response. So there's red and black, no continuity. Next we'll try red and green, no continuity. Next we'll try red and blue. So green and black also give us continuity. So there's our two pairs. So we just need to make sure that these are side by side and these are side by side. So you you can see that we have a standard four pin connector. There's a red pair black or red and there's a red and black pair, there's a blue and green pair. So we're just going to keep red and black together and we're going to go down here to one of our pairs which is green and black and We'll just go ahead and keep them together like that. And we're going to want to take some heat shrink tubing, or you can use electrical tape, but I prefer to use the tubing. And we'll just snip off some like that. And you always want to make sure not to forget to put it over the wires ahead of time because once they're soldered together you have to unsolder them to do this. Like that and like that. And then twist our wires together. Done. And then... Done. Done. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind, if you have to tilt the printer up on its end at all like this, make sure that the rods on the end are supported. Uh, the smooth rods are significantly uh, more difficult to bend, especially at this length, than the threaded rods. So you want to make sure, especially if your threaded rods, rods are longer than your smooth rods, that you don't actually put the weight on these and bend them. Uh, if you bend them, then you're going to end up potentially with like Z-wobble, or it may just be too difficult for the carriage to traverse, and it might jam, because again, not a ton of torque in these motors, so we work with the strengths that we have. 
Well, now we're going to want to look at mounting our ramp board. Uh, the easiest way is to mount the Arduino in the proper position and then just snap the ramp board on top, at least as far as I'm concerned. The uh, pins on this will definitely hold the ramp board in no problem. So we want to place it here, but we don't want to place it down tight against the wood because if it's tight against the wood, it's going to be pinning the wires from the Z motor. So I've got these screws here. I've got all sorts of lengths of them, and they're all relatively the same thickness. Well, they're all exactly the same thickness, that's the point. So we'll take some of these, and I'm going to create sleeves for them, basically, that'll allow them to keep the ramps board a couple of millimeters above the surface, which will allow for space for the wires to escape. So let's grab a few here that are identical length. Apparently that's easier said than done. I'll start off with one for now anyways. And I'll use my calipers. And we'll zero them out just to make sure. And we're going to look to see how thick this screw is. Well, let's switch back to metric. I was using inches earlier. If you don't have access to a 3D printer, you can use something like a pen, uh, cutting the outer shell into pieces to make these stands. So work with what you've got. So you can see that's a 3.5 millimeter thick screw. So I'm going to create a sleeve that's about three point, has a hole in it that's 3.8 millimeters and probably about a 7 or 8 millimeter square around it. And that's going to be the leg for this to stand on. It's going to be simple. It's not going to be a full bracket. And there's our four legs fresh off the printer. Now we just need four matching screws to make it happen. So at this point I'm going to pre-place the screws into the holes and then I'm going to simply slide my feet over top of the screws on the other side. With any luck I should be able to hold all of this in place and then all I have to do is position it where I want, screw all four screws in, and it'll all be nice and solid and put together. Well, unfortunately, the 3D printed feet were a little too loose for them to stay in position while I was doing this, so I ended up having to take the screws out, slide the clips in one at a time, line them up, and then screw them in. It took a little bit more time than I wanted it to, but overall it worked out the same. With the Arduino secure, now we can reapply the ramp board over top of it, and we're going to be able to start wiring this all up. Here we have the minimum position X end stop, then the max position X end stop, the minimum position Y end stop, the maximum position Y stop, then the minimum position Z stop, which is what we're actually after. So we'll go ahead and connect the Z to that. Then we have the Z axis motors. Now, if you've used the jumpers the way I have, then basically you want to make sure that you plug them in in order so that when you get to this point, you can just plug them in in the order. So green, yellow, orange, red. If the motors turn the opposite way that you want them to, all you have to do is reverse that order and it'll be fine. You don't have to worry about damaging them provided that you are plugging them in at least with the right couplings together. Repeat the process with the other set. In this case we have brown, black, white, gray. While we're here, we can go ahead and connect the extruder. The extruder is E0. And then connect our Y. Why not? Then our Y end stop. So again, X min, X max, Y min. Next we can connect our X end stop. And our X motor. Then while we're at it we might as well connect our thermistor. We'll go ahead and connect our thermistor to T0. Like that. 
Finally, what we're going to want to do is hook up the thermal cartridge for your hot end to the D10 connection on the board. Now, this isn't polarity specific, so all you have to do is unscrew the two terminals, stick your wires in, then tighten them down and you'll be good to go. When it comes to powering the fan for your hot end, you have a couple of options. This one here is my favorite. These two pins are either populated or they're not. I have two copies of the ramp board. On one, they are populated, and the other, they are not. If it is populated, all you have to do is solder or connect a two-pin jumper cable to your fan, and you can connect to this, and you're good to go. If you're decent with your soldering skills, you can actually just solder two wires to these if there are no pins, and again, just extend them to your fan, and you should be able to use that no problem. If your soldering skills aren't on point or you don't want to risk potentially damaging a board, the other option is to simply twist the positive and negative wires from your fans to the positive and negative wires from your power supply and then screw them both into the connector that connects to the end of the ramps board. This unfortunately joins your power supply and your uh, printer together, which makes it a little bit harder to move around, but considering the brick is the size of a laptop brick, it's not really that big of a deal. Well, let's get our printer in the upright position and lubricate those threaded rods. Before we can do any calibration, we're going to want to make sure that this doesn't bind up at all. So I'm just brushing on some silicone lubrication on here, and then I just run the axis up and down a few times to make sure everything's nice and smooth. If there's any squeaks, you're going to want to make sure that you get them straightened out and uh, everything cleaned up. Let's work on getting our printer calibrated. So let's start off by homing the axis. So here I'm homing the x-axis. Then you can use either a set of digital calipers or something like a measuring tape, and you're going to want to measure how far the axis moves. So I'm going to issue two commands moving 10 millimeters each from Repetier Host. You can use whichever software you want to to do the control. As you can see, it moves 6.6 .6 the first time. I'm going to go ahead and click 10 millimeters again, and 13.8. So we can then use 13.8 to calculate what the difference is. The original save value that I put in in my Marlin firmware was 600 steps per uh, per uh, movement. So we take 600 divided by 13.8 and then times it by 20 and that should give us our new value which is a bit over 800. So you'll enter that value in either using the M92 command from your controls which will allow you to adjust them without having to reflash your firmware or you can re-enter the values into the firmware that we talked about in video one and that'll basically adjust it. You may have to repeat this process a couple of times and also keep in mind that the motors aren't super accurate which means that uh, you may want to do like a measurement over 50 millimeters and get it to calculate that and there may be a little bit of play in between. After playing with it a bit I told it to move 50 millimeters and we get to 49.9 we can play with it a little bit more to get a little more accuracy, but 49.9 is pretty close. Point, uh, 0.1 millimeter loss over 50 is not terrible. We can then repeat the exact same processes on the other axes as well as the extruder. When you're calculating the amount of filament you need to use, what you'll do is use a pencil, measure up, say, 60 millimeters or 70 millimeters onto the filament, put a mark, then tell it to extrude 50 millimeters. Then measure the distance from the your original me measurement point, so the input of the extruder, to that line. You can then do the exact same calculation. So if you told it to extrude 50 and it only extruded 48, then you divide your current multiplier by 48, multiply it by 50, and you'll get the proper result. Uh, the actual calibration is pretty simple, but it can be intimidating to some people. So just take your time, and if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below, and I'll see if I can't help. Well, with all of our calculations made, we might as well go back to the firmware since we're going to have to make a couple of changes. The motors on these printers tend to have a, an ability to overheat. So one thing we're going to want to do is go into the configuration.h file in our firmware and we're going to switch it so that when the motors aren't in use it immediately disables them so they have a chance to cool off. Now, there's a warning here that says when the motors turn off, there's a chance of losing position accuracy. So you want to make sure you don't bump the printer, but I mean, that's pretty good advice for any printer. So under here, you'll see we have disable X, dis disable Y, and disable Z. And we're going to switch them from false to true for all of them. This is especially important for the Z axis. The X and Y will probably be in use most of the time, but the Z axis basically sits there and does nothing in between layers. So we don't want to put any extra effort on those motors than we would have to. Then we might as well go and uh, adjust our calculations for our stepper motors. Uh, 
So here we have our default st uh, axis step per unit. Yeah, default axis steps per unit. So these are the default ones that are. Or these are the ones I'd been playing with beforehand. But now it's time to adjust these to store them permanently. That way, uh, if we ever have to reset the firmware or whatever, this will be what it runs on. The other thing is too, we can adjust our maximum speed rate. I know mine is nine, so I'll set it to nine for those. And that way, if anything ever happens and I have to reset to my default configuration, my printer's still going to work. And you can still play with it using the firmware from there. So I ended up with a value of 828.38 for this one, 832.89 for that one, I think I was 8628 for that one, I'll have to revisit that later on and 450 I believe was still good for my extruder so again these values aren't going to be what your values are um, I recommend starting with the 600 600 um, you can start with a lower number for your z-axis as well and you're gonna have to calculate them it gets you close or at least gets it to perform and then you can make your adjustments and for the default max rate I would recommend starting with something like 8 8 uh, and 0.15, 0.15 for the uh, max speed rate for the z that way, uh, your printer is going to work. The real important thing here is that if you tune it too high, it's going to miss steps, and you may not realize it's missing steps, in which case you could be trying to calibrate, uh, and your calibration will never come perfect because sometimes it misses steps, sometimes it doesn't. So from there, you would just click Upload to send it back to the Arduino, and you should be ready to go for that. So cable management on this system is pretty much just going to be cable ties. Uh, you can leverage things like cable tying things to the Bowden tube to straighten them out. Uh, I prefer to design these brackets, and they're something I would m recommend printing for yourself once you've got your printer up and running, assuming you don't get the parts when you uh, initially order it. Um, so this is a piece I printed off that holds a screw so I can adjust the uh, Z-level uh, home switch, as well as has a channel that I can cable tie some of my wires into. What you'll want to do is you can screw the or turn the screw left and right to adjust when it hits the homing screw or homing switch for the Z height. So you'll bring it down so that when it hits the switch, the uh, hot end is just barely above the bed, just enough to slip a piece of paper underneath it with a bit of friction. And as you can see, I created a channel in here so that the belt has a place to come out as well, so it doesn't affect the functionality of the belt. Cable management on this unit is going to be largely subjective. Um, you're going to want to bind wires together where you can and attach them to the frame if possible but there's no necessarily right or wrong way to do it there's just a couple of guidelines that i can give you so here i'm tying the extruder motor and the uh, limiter switch on the x-axis together to bring them across underneath the printer i can then couple them to the y-axis motor here For the wires running up the other side of the z-axis, you're going to make sure that you leave enough slack so that it can freely move up and down all the way to the top, and then cable tie that bunch of wires together. You can buy some tubing that you could put around the wires to do a bit of strain relief on them, but in lieu of that, don't be too skimpy with the, uh, the cable ties. You can cable tie them in several places so that the entire chain of wires moves together as one. As for the rest of the wires, well, it's usually a bit of a rat's nest, but you can essentially just cable tie all of them together underneath, and if you've got enough slack, you can then either attach it to one of the legs or uh, just attach it to the wires coming from the Y-axis and the um, X limiter switch as well as the extruder. Just get everything bunched together and try to make sure there's not too much weight or uh, anything on it. Um, the only advice I can give you is watch for the moving parts, make sure that nothing's in the way or, you know, hitting the limiting switches, that type of thing, and you should be fine. Layer some masking tape on your bed and then go ahead and heat up your hot end to 160 to 180 degrees Celsius and repair your hose. Then you're going to need a pair of pliers and either a wrench or another pair of pliers and we're going to tighten down the hot end. You're going to want to do this when it's hot since the metal expands and you need to make sure that there's no path for the filament to find its way out. This liquid filament will find its way out if there's a way, so... Go ahead and tighten down to make sure it's nice and secure, and uh, you should be ready to start printing your first print. Well, I can't believe it. It's been four episodes, almost a month, and this wraps up my first tutorial. Uh, as you can see, the print completed pretty decently. He needed a little bit of cooling, and that's something we're going to have to look at in the future, but the layer lines on him are pretty impressive. He looks 
well, very shiny, first of all. Um, the overhangs came out okay, not perfect, but overall, I mean, it's better than some of the first prints I got out of my printer bot when I first started using it, so I'm pretty excited to see what we're going to be able to do with this in the future. I think there's some changes that we'll be able to make that'll make it easier to assemble for people in the future, as well as give better quality prints right off the bed. So we'll give it a couple of weeks soak time. Uh, next week will be a different 3D printer video. Um, and then probably the week after that, we'll go back with a video coming up with some of the enhancements that we can do. The Marlin firmware and the new models will be released in the next week or two once I've polished them up and uh, got them complete. So I know some of you guys were asking about that. Um, I would hold off on printing the parts if you haven't done it already because I think the changes I'm going to release are going to make them more stable parts that are easier to assemble and aren't prone to like breaking and whatnot when the bearings are inserted. So those are some changes that I'm hoping are going to make this a uh, better design overall. So let me know what you guys thought. This was my first tutorial and uh, I really enjoyed doing it. I've got some more stuff planned in the future which I'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Um, if you like this video, toss me a thumbs up. If you're new here, subscribe and click the bell so you'll get notified whenever I put out new content. If you've got questions or comments, well, toss them in the comments below. And until next time, stay creative.